so over the time that I worked with PERTS, we um, really focused on developing more and more resources for educators. And then in my last couple of years at PERTS, I spent a lot of time in the classroom working closely with teachers to understand. Um, we had developed a website, which I'll show you later, called the Mindset Kit. And we wanted to know like, how useful are these resources for educators. Turns out there was a lot we needed to learn about how to actually support educators. And it was that work that really drove my passion to leave and focus even more on that work. Um, so yeah, I say was, as she mentioned, I left at the end of 2017 to focus on um, working. I'm going to spend a year being an independent consultant before deciding on my next path. So this is sort of like my uh, gap year. <laughs> um, so before we jump into talking about this research on learning mindsets, I'm going to focus on growth mindset, which is you know the kinds of beliefs that can help or hinder students in really succeeding in their academic pursuits. I want you to just take a moment to look at this report card. This is an actual student's report card. The name's been removed and all identifiers removed. Um, and uh, just take a look for a minute and just think about what do you anticipate will become of this student when they leave high school. So some of you may have guessed this by um, the introduction in which you heard that I went to Stanford in my 40s. Uh, but that is my report card. So <laughs> I'm seeing some wide eyes. You're probably wondering, how did you get from that to Stanford? And so to give you a little bit of background on that, I'll just share a, uh, a little bit about my story, my history. So I grew up in a family where education wasn't valued. My father had a 10th grade education, and of the seven kids in my family, only three graduated high school on time. And as you can imagine, I was not one of them. Um, but I did eventually go back to a local college and get my GED, but I had a lot of really traumatic experiences in school and at home. So our home life was pretty challenging didn't have a lot of money. Um, there was also physical and emotional abuse going on. And um, I did have an undiagnosed learning disability. Um, so all of those things combined with the really difficult middle school where there was just some very um, basically abusive teachers and there was not a lot of support. You were commenting on the lack of you know, support. All of that was true. My parents were overwhelmed with having seven kids. It was like a wrecking ball landed in our house. It was really, really stressful for all of us. And so all of that left me just believing by the time that I graduated from high school that I just, education just wasn't my thing and that I didn't have what it took. Um, I didn't see any point to the schoolwork that I was being asked to do when I was in school. And so I just proceeded off into life and unfortunately I became um, what some researchers have called an opportunity youth. So, oh, I must have taken that slide out. I did because I wanted to shorten things. So I won't go into that, but some of you are probably familiar with this term, opportunity youth. Seeing some nodding. So basically what that means is um, kids between the ages of 16 and 24 that are not in school and not working. And the lifetime aggregated cost to society, to all of us, is $4.7 trillion. So it's a really big social problem. It's not just the problem for those students, it's a problem for all of us. And so I do like to sort of draw the parallel. This isn't just a sad story about me. This is actually a problem for society when we're not tending to those students who are disengaging. And so um, with that, we will move into talking about some of the ways that focusing on the psychological environment in schools and how students are experiencing and what their beliefs are can actually really help address some of that problem. So we're going to talk about what learning mindsets are and why they matter, um, how growth mindset is related to achievement, and then we're going to look at the, the area of language in terms of how it can impact the development of different mindsets. So there is a vast body of research in this area, and it's always a little bit painful for me to only talk about growth mindset because there's so many other types of research looking at these kinds of psychological experiences that they interlock with each other. But um, so I'm just very briefly going to touch on some of those other areas. So where does a motivation to learn come from? Well, the fact is you never actually see unmotivated babies, right? <laughs> Have you ever seen a baby just like fall down, get up and you know, it's like the hardest thing you'll ever do is learn to walk, but they just keep doing it. You don't ever see a baby just fall down and just go like, 
I'm just not a walker. <laughs> right? So what happens? Like, this is what you see. And this is how all babies are. They are, come on in there, have a seat. All babies are born learning machines, right? They love to learn. It gives them incredible joy. So the question really is, what happens in that process? And so what happens is that over time, we develop these different beliefs and perceptions about learning in the learning environment. And they act as a lens through which we interpret our day-to-day -day experiences, and particularly experiences of adversity. And these different interpretations can lead students to take very different behaviors in response to these experiences. So if you imagine a student getting back uh, an essay that they've worked really hard on, and they look at all the comments that the teacher has written, and they say to themselves, ugh, I guess I'm just not very good at this. That's very different interpretation than a student who looks at those same comments and thinks, wow, these are really helpful. And then the behavior that the student will take as a result of those interpretations can be very different. So the student thinking that, ugh, that just is evidence that they are not any good, will probably say, well, what's the point of revising this essay? Whereas the other student may say, these are really gonna make my next version even better. And so I want to just preface this whole conversation with um, and you know, uh, framing it that it's not the only factor that influences student outcomes, right? There's a lot of things that play a really important role in how students are going to be able to engage in learning experiences. So if their basic needs aren't being met, if they're coming to school and they haven't eaten or they don't have enough sleep, um, or they're chronically feeling stressed because they don't feel safe, it's going to be very hard for them to focus on learning. And likewise, students do need to have a certain level of ability to self-regulate, right? They need to be able to have reasonable executive function to focus on and make plans and, and, and act on those plans. And they need to have good social and emotional skills to be able to interact with those around them well. So I just want to acknowledge that there are these other factors. But we do know that the beliefs that students hold and their perceptions of the psychological climate that they're in when they're learning, these do matter. So what shapes students' mindsets? We know that a lot of messages come from a lot of different areas that send signals to students about what kinds of goals people think that they should hold, um, what they think they're capable of, and these messages are coming from society, depending on you know, some stereotypes that are out there about who can do well and who can't in what fields. Um, we know that the school environment, so for example, we know that the typical pattern in this country is that schools in high poverty communities get a lot less resource investment. So those teachers in those schools are often the ones that are new and so they're less experienced, so they are just haven't learned to be as good a teacher yet. Um, the schools don't have the same kind of financial resources to provide environments that are really positive for students and sending them signals that they're valued. Right. We know that the what goes on in the classroom is really important. I've been here working with teachers today and the next two days, and it's wonderful because we get to really dive into the kinds of classroom practices that can support developing positive beliefs. We know that families also play a role, and we're going to talk about some of that research tonight too. Peers have a huge influence, right? We know this. So all of these things combined are what influence students' beliefs and their perceptions, and these in turn affect their achievement. So tonight we're going to um, focus on the family environment and on what we know about changing students' beliefs directly. So there are three general buckets that we think about these psychological aspects of learning and motivation. The first one you're familiar with because we've already talked about it a little bit and you probably have a fair bit of familiarity. Uh, how many people are brand new to growth mindset? Couple people? Great, okay. Um, and so the growth mindset is the belief I can, I can develop my intellectual abilities. Belonging is another really important psychological aspect. Belonging is a core psychological need. Um, chronic loneliness can reduce your life expectancy by five years. And so it really is an important element, and there are a lot of things, particularly because of 
stereotypes and racial bias that has existed in this country, a lot of groups get messages that they don't belong in academic settings. Women in STEM fields, for example, is another common stereotype that can really affect how well those, those individuals can do in academic environments. Uh, purpose and relevance. How many of you like doing things that are mindless and boring? <laughs> anybody? Anybody at all? <laughs> uh, so yeah, this one is actually really important. And there's uh, a lot of really wonderful research about ways to make learning more meaningful for students so that they actually feel like what they're learning matters and that what they're learning is helping them to contribute to something bigger than themselves. Turns out this is actually a really big motivation for all of us. When we feel like we can give back, it's really motivating. When we feel like we're helping somebody else, very motivating. Not so motivating when you feel like you're being targeted for help, right? Sending you signals that you're kind of, you're not competent and you need help. So, so this is the three core beliefs that we work a lot on in terms of the intervention research and how to support students in feeling more engaged and motivated when they're in school. So um, they all interact with each other, as I said earlier, and um, like we're going to talk about some of the research and then I'll come back to this, how they kind of support each other. So we're going to focus tonight on growth mindset, as I said. And this research was pioneered by a researcher named Carol Dweck. And Carol began with a really uh, curiosity about why some students, when they were presented, she was you know, working with students, she was interested, this was early in her career. Why are some students, when you give them a really challenging problem, why do they light up and look excited about being challenged, while other students really look um, uh, they take on a more of a helpless response where they just give up quickly and don't even try that hard. So her interest in those differences and wanting to understand it led her to start doing um, different ways to probe what was going on and what she came up with was that basically there were two sort of ends of the spectrum and there's gradation in between but in general she found that students either believed that intelligence was malleable it was like a muscle that you could grow and get bigger. Or they had this belief that intelligence was a fixed trait, like eye color, and you're born with a certain amount of it, and there's nothing you can do about it. So it turns out these different beliefs lead to very different reactions to common everyday learning experiences. And so what she found was that it affected all of these things. So students with a growth mindset, their goal in school is to learn. Not surprising, seemed like a good goal. So they see school as a place to grow that muscle, their brain. Whereas students with a fixed mindset, their experience in school and their goal is really to look smart because this is an environment where people are constantly judging you and evaluating you. So uh, their reactions to mistakes and failures, these are really important for, for learning, right? You need to be willing to make mistakes because there's no, not really any way to learn without taking that risk. And so what she found, what the research has shown over the years is that students who have a growth mindset are a lot more resilient when they experience failure and when they experience making mistakes because they see those as a normal part of the learning process and surmountable, that they can improve and overcome it. Whereas students with a fixed mindset, they tend to have a helpless response because they see this as proof that they're not smart enough and being challenged. So as I described in those early experiments that Scar Carol was doing, that these students really showed like excitement, so we call that an approach uh, reaction. Um, they see it as an opportunity to learn and stretch themselves. Whereas students with a fixed mindset tend to avoid um, being challenged. They uh, want to stick with what they're comfortable with because that's where they feel their sense of competence is really anchored to is doing well. So they see pr effort as actually an indictment of low ability. If you have to try hard at something, then you must not be very good at it. Kind of counterintuitive in some ways, but also makes sense in other ways if you think about the underlying belief. Getting critical feedback, also very important for learning, right? And students with a growth mindset, they interpret that as uh, part of the learning process. They're more receptive to it because they see it as how they're going to improve. And students with a fixed mindset, on the other hand, again, it's uh, evidence that they don't have what it takes if they need to be corrected. So they tend to tune out critical feedback. So we've seen a lot of data showing that these different beliefs 
they really do impact achievement. And up until this study um, in 2016, most of those were on a small-ish scale. We saw, you know, that it had an effect, but it was, there was always questions about, like, is this really a representative sample? Is this some selected group? So in this study, um, Dave Panescu is the executive director of PERTS, and he partnered with Susana Claro, who is from Chile, and managed to work in collaboration with the Chilean government and had the assessment surveys for growth mindset and fixed mindset embedded into the 10th grade achievement test that all students in the country in the 10th grade have to take for language arts and mathematics. And so what they found was pretty hardcore evidence proving that these things really do matter. They found that students with a fixed mindset were four times more likely to score in the bottom fifth. Students with a growth mindset were three times more likely to score in the top fifth. But what was really amazing about this study is that when they looked at socioeconomics, the parents' um, level of wealth, and we know that growing up in poverty in and of itself, controlling for all other factors, depresses performance, depresses achievement. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I won't go into, but it, it's just a thing that we know. And so what they found when they looked at family income level by, um, family income level by the um, scores that students were getting, the solid line is fixed mindset students, the dotted line is growth mindset students. So you can see that at every level of family wealth, students with a growth mindset are doing better. And the in so better, in fact, if you look at language arts, they're performing the bottom decile of family wealth. Students with a growth mindset are performing as well as their peers in the 95th percentile. And in mathematics, it's 80th percentile. So um, <coughs> this is great, but what do we know about actually helping students adopt a growth mindset? So what, um, well, actually, before we go there, I want to just draw your attention again. I put this in the wrong spot. I was moving things around tonight to make the talk shorter. I think that we will come back to this slide. Um, so what do we know about changing students' beliefs? Um, Perth's is, uh, like I said, where I got my start in this work, and it was really a quest to take some interventions that had shown great promise um, when researchers were heavily involved, and they were working closely with the schools to make sure that the kids got the right kind of message, and they were teaching kids about the neuroscience, about how your brain grows when you work really hard, and how you know the neurons form new connections, and they showed that this really could help students do better. Um, but how do we get these out there and make sure that you don't lose the fidelity of these interventions at scale? Um, so there's a lot of promising programs in the past that when they were sort of attempted to implement them at scale, they actually really lost a lot of their potency. And so the quest with PERTS was to see, can we turn these into online modules that can be delivered to, to schools and colleges everywhere with basically these programs are now available for free. And this one's for college students. There's also one for high school students. And um, so what it is is very simple online module. Takes about 30 minutes for students to go through. They just simply read text like this. And this is really grounding them in the evidence for the science behind, like, your brain really does grow. So it's just what I was saying a minute ago. When you learn new things, the connections in your, between your nerve cells actually multiply and get stronger. And the more you challenge your, your mind to learn, the more your brain cells connect to each other and the stronger those connections get. And then we give students quotes that help them sort of develop a peer norm that other kids are thinking about this, this way too. And so this quote was actually written by a student. Um, this one is for college level students. But when we ran, on this program is actually going through a national study right now, which is huge, like over 10,000 students are going through to see with an intervention that is delivered to a representative population. So schools that are not selected by the researchers, they are actually selected by an outside company to make sure that they match like truly what is the population in this country look like. And the, the essays that we used in that, we did a contest where we had schools that were actively working to bring growth mindset to their students. We had students write those essays. So these are really things that students said about why it was helpful for them to learn to have a growth mindset. 
Then we always, with these programs, um, this is growth mindset, but we've done similar programs in um, other areas, and they always include the self-reflection activities where students make it their own. They're asked to, um, how would you explain these ideas to other students? And this um, is one where they're explaining that. We also ask them about, like, if a friend of yours had a really bad grade on an exam, how would you talk to them about it? And this serves the purpose of helping them to mentally rehearse what they might say to themselves the next time that they encounter a challenge. And so all of these elements are included in these kinds of interventions. So there's always, um, it's best when there's a really good clear analogy. When you have source credibility is the sort of technical term for this. So scientific evidence for the mechanism behind why this is true, this new idea that you're trying to pitch to these kids, you need to prove that there's some evidence behind it. And it also really helps all of us when we're being um, given a new idea to think about, well, uh, you tend to trust your peers more, right? And this self-authoring piece, so we also make sure that it's really clear that students don't feel stigmatized, so we actually ask them for their help explaining these ideas to other students. And it's not a lie, we, uh, like I said, we are using those quotes, and we are um, helping other students by the way we ask students to write about these. Um, but these in this is also that, like I said, the internalization process. And so what we've seen is that with high school students, the program is um, targeting students in ninth grade because often when you enter a new environment, that's where um, students tend to feel the most sort of doubt about their competence in that new environment. Can they succeed? And that's often when students are transitioning is when they have the biggest decline in their performance. So entering middle school, entering high school, also entering college. And so what we found is with um, overall a six point increase in GPA and course pass rate, but actually 20% increase for students in the bottom, uh, students who are most at risk. So students who are at risk of failing the previous semester were categorized as at risk. And in a separate study, um, the growth mindset intervention um, students were then given the opportunity to select which math problems they wanted to work on before the next module started, and after the growth mindset intervention, they became more willing to take on challenging problems. And so growth mindset is great. We know that it's got this potential to influence academic outcomes, and recently we've seen some really exciting results from doing a, an intervention to help students think about personality as malleable and emotional regulation skills as malleable. So in this study, um, they took teens who had um, pre-existing conditions for anxiety or depression and helping them think more malleably, malleable, thinking about their ability to change and improve as malleable. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long day. <laughs> um, it led those them to have decreased symptoms over six months or eight months, and this was self-reported. But it was also they it, they tracked what parents' perceptions were of their kids, and the parents didn't know that their kids had been randomized into a, a, a treatment group. So this is um, pretty exciting to me because developing a growth mindset about um, emotion regulation has been very important to me personally because my childhood experiences left me with PTSD. And so that was uh, really, there's a lot of stigma around PTSD and I was reluctant to talk about it. This is actually the first time this trip where I've talked about it publicly. And um, part of it was that there is a large perception out there. I have had people in the healthcare profession tell me there is no treatment for this. It's a life sentence, basically. And I refuse to believe it, and I have worked really hard at um, trying to understand what does it take to live with this in a way where it's not ruling my life, and I have made remarkable progress, and there are new treatments that do uh, really help with these kinds of um, challenging trauma-related experiences. Um, when I work with teachers, we do an activity called the Growth Mindset, Fixed Mindset Continuum, and we uh, throw out different ideas of different abilities and things like how malleable is this? How much do you believe this is malleable? And the point of the exercise is to see, A, we all have a mixture of mindsets, right? 
We all have mixed, fixed, and growth mindsets. There may be some areas where we have a really strong growth mindset. We know we can get better at math, but when you ask me if I'm going to become a good singer, maybe not so much. So, so that's just normal, and it's important to know that that's normal, so that activity helps to sort of highlight that. But what it also brings us to is things like, well, how malleable is a learning disability, right? So thinking about, okay, maybe it's malleable. This is what I had to come to terms with with PTSD. Yes, it's malleable, but actually it's going to take a long time. It's not going to change overnight. Because at first, when I was like really had my heels dug in that this was something that I could fix, every time I would not have, like when I would have a PTSD recurrence, I would beat myself up for not having fixed the problem. So it's important to recognize that there is gradation in w how malleable things are and to have realistic expectations when you're working with students, even though they may be developing a growth mindset, it may take a long time for it to show up, right? So actually, um, that's where I wanted to return to here and have you just think about the emotional experience of these different mindsets, right? So tell me, uh, what are you noticing about the experience of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset? You know, uh, people's biggest misconception about growth mindset and fixed mindset, this whole area, is that it's simple. And it's actually not. It's, it's subtle. There are so many subtle ways. I worked in this area for years. The, the um, last time I was here, I was with my colleague, Carissa Romero. And we were in um, New York or some, we were traveling somewhere, so we were staying in the same room together. And I said something just randomly about how I was so bad at grammar. And she just turned to me and she was like, that is such a fixed mindset thing to say. I was like, you're right. I <laughs> caught. <laughs> so so it's, it, I, these messages that we tell ourselves are so embedded in, in us as adults that it takes a long time to surface those areas where we do have fixed mindset beliefs. So with that said, um, that is an, a really important piece to talk about is the self-talk, right? And, and what we know is that self-talk, this is an entirely separate body of research that converges on the same, the same point. So Kristen Neff and her colleagues, many other researchers too, but she really pioneered this work, is that um, she did work on, on self-compassion and they were able to show pretty consistently that uh, war vets who had experienced a lot of war trauma were more likely to develop PTSD if they lacked self-compassion. And so there's a lot of research now on the role that self-compassion, being able to forgive yourself when you make mistakes, to see it as not like an um, indictment of your like worth, it is really powerful. So part of developing a growth mindset also is learning to listen to our own self-talk. How are we talking to ourselves? When you say, ah, I'm just so, I'm just terrible at this, or I, I'm no good at math, the one thing you can do that is very simple is simply add yet at the end of that sentence. Because that puts it into uh, a growth trajectory, right? You can get better at this, whereas, if you just say, I'm terrible at grammar, that just is like saying, well, that's, there's no hope. You can never improve at that. So um, I loved this, these quotes. Um, I'm not going to read them fully because you can read them yourselves here. Um, but I really think that her work is a nice intersection. Her work has also shown this to be really central for resilience. right? So being able to be compassionate with ourselves and be compassionate with others when they make mistakes is really central core feature of developing a growth mindset. So negative emotions really have this negative effect on our ability to uh, be, be in a learning experience and actually optimize the learning in that experience because negative emotions impair, they're, they're really draining our attention. And so this is another thing to think about when we look at the difference between the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. There's a lot of negative emotions happening when you're um, making mistakes, when you're in a learning environment. There's a lot of stress. And that actually just, in and of itself, impairs the ability to learn at your full capacity. Okay. So how these things have their effect over time 
Um, what, we, what I didn't get to show you is that we're showing longitudinally that when you help students adopt a growth mindset, that that improves over time. So the community college work we've been doing, we've been looking at students' trajectory over two years and showing that there it grows and gets better, stronger over time. And so that might seem counterintuitive because most um, programs that l work to deliver an intervention, it has powerful effects right away, but then it fades over time. So that's what we're finding so exciting about this research is that it actually triggers an internal process that is self-replicating. So what happens, this is the theory, you experience a setback, a challenge of some kind with a growth mindset, you might say to yourself, well, maybe I need to work a little harder or maybe I need to learn some new strategies or get some support. And then um, this leads to higher achievement, which then reinforces this idea that you can actually Im you know, affect your own outcomes. Um, whereas with a fixed mindset, you experience a setback, you reduce effort and withdraw because you feel like it's hopeless and pointless. And that leads to lower achievement, which then reinforces this negative downward path. And so a lot of the ways that psychological um, interventions are designed has to do with these self-replicating processes. And it has to do with the narratives we create for ourselves about the meaning of events. And so um, that's something to just think about is one of the ways that we know identity is sort of held together is the narrative. And so when, um, how many of you are familiar with the, the important work of attachment in early childhood and the role that that plays? So a lot of you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that work, we actually now know that the attachment that a child and infant forms with its primary caregiver um, has really powerful long-lasting effects. And one of, it can be like physically damaging to have that interrupted in some, in some significant way. And the way that we assess a healthy attachment in adulthood is how coherent is their narrative. And so the narrative is what underpins a lot of these psychological processes. And when you're trying to say, does this person have a fixed mindset or what's going on with why are they feeling like they don't belong? The questions you want to probe for are what is the narrative that they're telling themselves about those negative experiences? That is going to surface the compassion, the self-compassion or lack of it, and it's going to help you understand what's the lens that they're looking at the world through. So with that, one of the ways that we send powerful signals to ourselves and to others is through our language. And so we're going to look at two aspects of, of language tonight, um, the role of praise and the role of reactions to failure. And this is specifically around parenting now that I'm going to focus. So the language we use tells others what we believe and what we value, and we all depend on feedback to understand what's expected of us, what kind of goals we should have, and what others believe is the cause of our success and failure. So in the 70s, we had this wonderful thing called the self-esteem movement. And this idea was, you know, had the best of intentions, right? The idea was you praise kids all the time, and it's going to help them develop healthy self-esteem, and that will make them resilient to any kind of negative life experiences they might encounter. And so that every kid on the team gets a trophy. Is it still going on, right? Lots of yeah, you have kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how persistent that practice is. So what happens when you give every kid on the team a trophy? They call it contingent self-worth. So when you're praised a lot, when you're um, given rewards of any kind for your behavior, it creates dependency on that reward. So it's the same phenomena with praise, so yeah. But let's take a look at one of the original studies that had such a big impact on our understanding of the role of praise and what kinds of praise. So what Claudia Mueller, she was a graduate student with Carol, um, what she wanted to look at was, does different kinds of praise influence students' response to failure? And it's a very clever study. They took a bunch of fifth graders, and they gave them a bunch of these um, IQ problems. They're from the Ravens Progressive Matrices. And, you know, they're kind of uh, ambiguous. So, you know, you, you probably can figure out which one is. This one's a medium sort of difficulty for these kids. Any guesses on the answer? 
seven? <laughs> yes. So it's basically a those two go together in either direction and they form the number seven. So what they did was they had kids come into the lab and they gave them a bunch of these problems to work on um, that were moderately difficult. So they gave them all feedback in the form of praise or, you know, they gave all the kids feedback after the first round of problems. But they gave them three different kinds of praise. In the first group, they um, said, it was just the control group, the neutral praise. They just said, wow, that's a really good score. In the second group, they said, wow, that's a really good score. You must be really smart at this. So this is the praising their, their kind of a fixed ability, right? In the um, growth mindset effort praise condition, they said, wow, that's a really good score. You must have tried really hard. So note the difference here is the attribution for the causes of success. There's no attribution here. It's just neutral. But these two both have an attribution that um, we'll see has uh, an important impact. So then what they did was they gave all the students much more difficult problems to work on. So this is an example of a difficult problem. Anyone want to take a stab at this one? So it's a um, multiplication, I mean, sorry, a math problem. So negative, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. So you get positive two. So it's that one. So don't feel bad. <laughs> the first time this, Carissa, the first time Carissa said she presented this at Stanford to a lab of Stanford professors, nobody got it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm always more impressed when somebody gets it, actually. What's that? Yeah, it works either way. That's the way these are designed. <coughs> so then they gave all students the same negative feedback after they worked on these because, as you can tell, these are kind of ambiguous. It's hard to know whether you got it right or wrong. And they just told them all, that's a lot worse. <laughs> so then they gave all of the students another set of moderately difficult problems. Oh, I, for I think I forgot to move. <laughs> yep, I did. Okay. So they gave them all moderately difficult problems in the beginning, and then they gave them moderately difficult problems at the end. And I apologize for the next slide because this is in the wrong spot. That should be down. The green should be outlining the bottom one. And then they looked at how they did on this last round. So the same level of difficulty, but a setback in the middle. So what happened was that the, the Ones who got the neutral praise that wasn't making any attributions, they did about the same because, um, so this is um, the number of, number of problems that they got right. So you get a little better when you do these things because you start to figure out some of the problems, some of the um, techniques. The students who were given the effort praise did significantly better, especially compared to those who had been given the ability praise. So the thinking is actually that when you praise a student for a fixed trait and they feel really good about doing really well, but then they have a setback, they might be saying to themselves, well, I did really well because I'm so smart, but now I'm not doing well. I guess I'm not so smart after all. And so then it's that withdraw effort, kind of withdraw, trying really hard, and it leads to this poor performance. And the thing that I want to point out about this is that this is not students' innate beliefs that are being tested here. This is, this is a condition that is it's called priming, where you basically, the way that the praise was given in that moment changed their behavior, right? So this is what, going back to what I said earlier about you can have a growth mindset and the environment can trigger you to behave in fixed mindset ways. So. It's also important when thinking about fixed and growth mindset to understand that just because a student is behaving in a particular way doesn't necessarily mean they have a, a fixed mindset. It might be that there's something in the environment that's shutting them down. So I think that's another thing that I see a lot with educators is this, because they care about wanting to help students, they want to identify and they want to label. Like, oh, it's a fixed mindset. That's what's the problem here. I got to fix their fixed mindset. And that in and of itself is kind of a fixed mindset belief, right? It's a bit of a <laughs> tailspin of fixed mindset beliefs. So anyway, back to the study. What was also really interesting in the study is that they asked these kids when they were leaving the lab to write down their score anonymously 
for the next incoming group, just so that those incoming people could have a sense of what to expect. And what they found is that the students who were in given the intelligence praise were significantly more likely to lie. <laughs> and they didn't, they only lied in one direction, right? <laughs> They're only inflating their scores. So I think, for me, this gives me a really different lens on why students cheat, right? There's this self-worth that's kind of at stake, and you'll do whatever it takes to make sure that you can get that grade and prove that you're, prove to others that you're okay. One reason, not the only reason why students cheat, but something to think about. So let's look at the effect um, outside of the lab, because that was a very controlled condition, right? That was playing with kids' minds by <laughs> giving them these different kinds of praise. But what's actually going on in the homes and how predictive is what goes on, you know, in terms of the praise that's getting used in the home of students' mindsets? So in this study, <coughs> they wanted to look at that. They wanted to look at two things. What kind of praise do kids hear? Like what's normal day-to-day -day kind of praise? And does parents' use of praise predict their kids' mindsets? And so they did this very long study where they videotaped um, parent-child interactions, um, 90 minutes at age three different term t uh, time points, so 14 months, 26 months, and again at 38 months. And they coded the different praise for what kinds of praise it fell into, what are the categories, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then they had surveys, um, students completed surveys at the age of seven and eight. And <coughs> I'm going to show you a couple of videos because they're just so darn cute of these kids being interviewed. <laughs> uh, but just to before that, this is the kind of how they were defining process praise. So praise that is really emphasizing um, the processes, the efforts, or the actions. Like w when describing what a child is doing, you're talking about their actions. Um, those are some examples. And then person praise is um, praising things that are typically thought of as fixed traits. And then there's other praise that doesn't really fall into either of those categories. And so what they found actually is that the bulk of praise falls into this other category. Like process praise and person praise, they're actually the mi minority of the types of verbal interactions that get qualified as praise. But turns out that when we look at um, well, the kids, so this is the kids' interviews at age seven where they were you know, like getting a sense of like what kind of beliefs do they have. So they would ask these kids, how much do you want to do mazes or spelling word math problems that are easy so you can get a lot right? Or would you like to do some that are really hard? So I love that last one because she's actually talking about like effort and trying hard and struggling is good. Like, I want to meet her parents. <laughs> so basically what they found was that it wasn't about only one kind of praise or only the other when we look at process praise and person praise. It tended to be both happening in, in most homes, right? But what they found is that the difference, the, the proportional difference between them was what mattered. So the more um, likely, like the, the higher rates of giving process praise were related to kids developing a growth mindset. So uh, that is the, um, oh, and then uh, this is another really important thing that just breaks my heart that they found in this study is that girls get a lot less process praise. So um, something to keep in mind when you see that girls maybe are not as um, willing to take on like challenge and they're not as accustomed to being sort of pushed. This is partly just coming from societal norms and how women are treated a little differently. Um, so reactions to failure is another area that we found is really important for predicting kids' mindsets. And so um, what these statements um, are asking is kind of getting at this. So maybe just take a moment yourself and think about how you would answer these in a uh, agree-disagree kind of fashion. And I'm guessing, since we've been talking so much about growth mindset tonight, that you're probably not likely to answer the first two as <laughs> in the affirmative. And so what, uh, what was found in this study um, 
I forgot to cite the researcher. It's Kyla Hamovitz. Anyway, she found that parents who disagreed with the first two statements and agreed with, uh, disagreed with the first and agreed with statements two and three were more likely to have kids with a growth mindset. So this is not surprising, right? Like, if, if your reaction to failure is really negative, of course it's going to signal to your kids that I'd better not make any mistakes. This is a really bad thing. So basically, when you respond positively to failures, then you're basically, you know, you're sending signals that you can learn from them. So learning and improvement are more important than grades or performance. Failure is good if you use it as an appropriate, as an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, and so last, just, there's just a couple more um, pieces that I want to show you. This is the mindset kit that I mentioned that PERTS developed. Um, there's a whole section here for parents. Um, so if you want to learn more about this research or explore, there's a resource library as well, this little, tiny little magnifying glass. If you click on that, there's a magical world that opens up on the other side, which is um, resources that educators themselves have uploaded. And we've also, PERTS has uploaded a lot of these. And some of my dissertation research is going to end up in here too, which is great. Um, so the last piece I want to just talk about is this interaction between these. And we've already touched on this a little bit, right? So if you're um, not feeling like you belong in an environment, then it's going to be harder to feel comfortable taking risks. And you may even behave in ways that look on the outside like fixed mindset. Similarly, if you don't see the point of what you're being asked to do, then you're going to be like, well, why should I stretch myself and take this risk and you know risk looking like a fool in front of all these people and just like forget about it right so so these things all fit together in really important ways um, the other thing about purpose and relevance is that for me it was the thing that actually drove me to overcome all of my anxiety about going back to school because I worked my way up to become director of a social services agency in a really poor region of LA and it was the like seeing what was going on and realizing a that I was getting validation that I actually had some pretty good ideas and b that I really wanted to impact this situations on a larger scale it was that sense of purpose that got me over the hurdle of believing like that I just wasn't smart enough to go to college and that is true of a lot of students who like me come back to school late in life it's it's some desire to really like want to make a difference either directly for their families or on a, a larger societal level and that sense of purpose of wanting to give back is very motivating um, so next I want to just show you quickly one way in which um, as parents you might want to just be aware of the profound impact of extracurricular activity participation. So why do these matter? Well, it turns out that kids who are consistently involved in extracurricular activities are more likely to go to college. How much? 400%. 400% more likely to go to college uh, with, with, uh, than those with no involvement and 70% more likely than those with only sporadic involvement. And the reason why I wanted to bring this to your attention is that when I ran those essay contests, I think I mentioned this, maybe I didn't, but all of the students wrote about how they first learned to have a growth mindset was either through sports or music. And that is because in those environments, it is perfectly normal. Everybody expects that you have to make mistakes, you have to fail, you have to learn from them, you have to practice, you have to get feedback and support. And when students were given this additional little message that, oh, that's true of my intelligence too, it was easier for them to generalize it. So being part of extracurricular activities that, that provide those kinds of opportunities makes it a little easier, I think, for students. But the other piece is that they have a really powerful effect on belonging. Being part of something and being in a group where you are sharing in an experience together, you're moving towards a goal together, very strong sense of belonging is fostered in that. This is actually reported in Putnam's book, Our Kids, which is a fantastic book. And what it's linked with is higher GPA, higher educational aspirations, more positive work habits. So again, like learning, being able to directly see the consequences of your effort or lack of effort, um, psychological resilience. Part of this, I really believe, has to do with the, so the social ties. 
Like you're a lot more resilient if you have strong social network. There's so much data on that now. They were more likely to be um, more civically involved and their wages in the future were higher. So these, these are various studies that have looked at this over time. So this is a very robust finding. Sadly, on the other side of this, uh, lower involvement, more likely to have truancy, delinquency rates are higher, dropout rates are higher, riskier behavior. This actually was very true for me. I had a very visceral connection to this when I, when I saw this because I had a really awful middle school experience, which was grade eight through 10, where I was from in Canada. But for grade 11, I went to a high school that had a very strong theater program and I got involved. I was instantly re-engaged in school. I, I was actually working hard in my classes. I cared about school again. And even at that age, without understanding any of this, I was like, hmm, kind of wish this had happened sooner. <laughs> you know, and it was, it had everything to do with feeling part of something bigger than myself. You know, this theater teacher was incredible, put on multiple shows throughout the year. I felt very connected to the other kids. Somehow that just translated into caring more about school. And, and I think that it also had a lot to do with the sense of competency. There's the overdoing it, and I, you know, I know we're um, getting late. I actually included, and then I took it out because I wasn't sure we'd have time. It was a really great piece on NPR about looking at Mayan families and looking at um, American families, at the difference in kids' ability to focus and pay attention. And the Mayan kids were like, riveted on, on whatever was going on, even when they weren't being asked to pay attention. And in one of the th pieces that the researcher talked about was the fact that they had a lot of unstructured time and they were just enculturated into paying attention to what adults did because they could then, they were often, um, it's much more in interdependent culture and so they're used to being asked to help out. So I they were intrinsically motivated to pay attention. It wasn't like they were being told to. So yes, I do think that there is, there is a some tendency to overdo it on kids and not give them a lot of free time and that free time, unstructured time is also really important. So thank you for bringing that up. We have, we have a really huge gap growing in this country between the wealthy and the poor, and this is just one of many gaps that is forming, that the kids, the wealthier communities, kids are all participating in extracurriculars, but in the high poverty communities, the schools get less funding for extracurriculars. There's, ga there's, there's barriers to participation there where you have to earn a certain grade to get in, so the kids who could most benefit are actually being kept out of those programs. And then there's also this pay to play where parents are out being asked to contribute and in those poorer communities, the parents can't afford it. So, so there's a problem here. Like this is a very important bit of finding that we have, but it's being differentially distributed. So I just wanna put up this last slide of two slides, just the summary of what we've talked about tonight. So we know that um, first of all, just to be really clear, having a growth mindset, means believing that abilities are malleable, that's it. <laughs> that is a very simple part of this formula. It is not saying anything about everybody can become a genius. It's just you believe that traits are malleable. Um, it improves engagement and achievement and it makes you more resilient to failure and more receptive to feedback. We all have a mixture of both and yes, bottom thing there. So recommendations, praising the process, um, this helps students focus on things that they actually have control over, right? You don't have control over your genetics. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> uh, normalizing mistakes and making those part of the learning um, experience. So it's, it's something that should be thinking about like how you're modeling this for your kids when you make mistakes, right? Being open and, and vulnerable and, and showing them that you're learning from your own mistakes. And um, I think this is really important too, is helping kids see with these extracurriculars or whatever they're doing in their life, there is some ways in which they're probably already demonstrating. So shifting away from a deficit framing to thinking about like what are their strengths and how can we build on them?